Good evening, post air show folks. It is our drone show here on EA Radio. We're going to try and dive deep into the details and some of the hurdles that we are facing in the uh, the drone and UAS uh, industry. And we are very lucky to be sitting down with Earl Lawrence, uh, director of the FAA UAS Airspace Integration Office. I had to write that down. <laughs> Practiced it a few times. Uh, yes, and he has that unenviable task to try and figure out what to do with this very fast emerging industry that's coming in into the aviation world and how to kind of parse out who has what rights to what space uh, when everybody is pretty sure it's them, right? <laughs> that's right. <laughs> so is is that, if we were to try and give like an overview of your role, is that a... a, a Maybe an oversimplification, but uh, somewhat uh, accurate? Yeah, may, maybe. I'll explain it a little bit okay. more. Um, my job is actually not just a – it's integration office. And uh, part of what it is talks about, and when we say integration, mm -hmm. is I'm integrating the FAA at the same time we're integrating UAS into the airspace. Ah. Uh, so both sides. It, yeah, it's both sides. How do we get everybody to pull together? So I'm in that inevitable uh, position. I, I bring all the various FAA offices together mm -hmm. um, so that we're speaking with – with one FAA out, as we like to say, with one applicant. So out to the community and in, in dealing with their needs and wants. Sure. Um, in trying to do that, are you trying to like uh, more clearly define the constituents of these, you know, the, this is what GA wants and this is what commercial wants and this is what the commercial operator, drone operator wants and this is what the hobbyist wants and this is the fears of the public, uh, public that we have to deal with and the safety needs of the government and I mean, uh, is that kind of your ball? I, it, it is looking at all those interests, but we're not segregating them out because okay. that is one thing what true integration is bringing everybody together and, mm -hmm. and as you found and I'm sure people have been talking about all week it, there's it's getting pl pretty blurry in between oh, yeah. ga and commercial when you talk about unmanned and it's really about automated systems mm -hmm. and we're seeing those grow and the you know the great electronics looks how we're using ipads in the cockpits we're uploading programs we're using great autopilots a lot of that is complete crossover with the it industry and the phone companies and so it's really how do we all pull that together um, but you did mention cities, states, the communities. Mm -hmm. That's a whole nother community. Um, we used to deal with pilots, and now we deal with everybody in the United <laughs> States. Uh, Oh the, the, yeah, there's there's one thing I think you, you'd like and the audience would like is uh, the mayor of San Francisco is on our drone advisory committee, and um, it was Mayor Lee. He He's deceased. He had a sudden heart attack last year. But one of the things he said was, I have an airport. I got an airport manager. I got an infrastructure. I got all of this thing. And then somebody went and made my entire city the airport because it's now in the <laughs> palm of your hand. Uh-huh. That that is that is a great analogy, and and in fact, yeah, <laughs> the world is our airport. <laughs> I love it. Uh, so there's been a lot of steps, uh, kind of the two steps forward, one step back. I think in in how to uh, address a lot of the issues within the industry. Uh, one of the latest out is the Lance program, the low altitude authorization and notification capability. Um, can you give me a quick one or two sentence kind of summary of what that's about? Sure. Really what that replaces is right now in the manned world, you get on the radio, you talk to the controller, you get access into controlled airspace. What Lance does is let two computers talk to each other, and it's really the same thing. And right. so you're getting still authorization to be in that airspace. Uh, it is all about controlled airspace, but we're <laughs> automating it. That's our version of automating internally um, and catching up with the uh, way computers talk better to computers and people talk better to people. And so yeah. that's really what we're dealing with. Yeah, it kind of comes out way faster than your normal call them, get wait for a waiver, right. anything yes. like that. Yeah. Yes. Now, that's been uh, slowly rolled out across the nation, so it, it hasn't hit all areas quite yet. What have you learned with the rollout so far? Oh, a tremendous amount. One of the things that, that we're learning as an agency is to really be more like um, setting standards and working with the Internet. Um, because there's not one definition for all of this. So what we're doing with this program, we're working with third parties. Um, it's really about setting protocols for communication. So, you know, on the Internet, you've got different web pages. People present some different things. But the way the computers talk to each other, it's really all about speaking that same language. Mm -hmm. And so we have our FAA computer with our data about where you can fly, when you can fly there. And it's making that available to all these folks that, who build these beautiful apps on mm -hmm. all of our phones that provide all kinds of extra things in there. But it lets you know where you can operate safely and how high you can operate safely. 
Uh, so not only is it kind of rolling out geographically, mm-hmm. but also kind of functionally. Uh, right now, from what I understand, uh, the land system really only applies to airspace. Do you have some intentions to make that include all operational waivers, daylight waivers, multiple aircraft waivers, all that sort of stuff? Yeah, not on an automated function. Um, so you mentioned waivers. Um, mm-hmm. Waivers to us are is because we don't have the rules in place. And so what we would oh. prefer <laughs> is to have certified aircraft in place that can that are just all authorized to operate at night, authorized to operate over people. And, okay. and in fact, that's uh, our operations over people rule was signed out by the uh, secretary Mm -hmm. um, last month. It's uh, up at OMB, making its way through the system. Okay. Um, So that will include night in operations over. So is Lance a Band-Aid approach until we get a better, uh, until we get those rules in place? Um, No, Lance is actually in there. It says in controlled airspace, you need authorization. So it's not a Band-Aid. It's that replacement instead of talking to a controller. They don't want you all calling the tower and saying, can I fly my uh, UAS or my my light aircraft uh, um, in, in a particular area? Yeah, we want right. to do that electronically. So to piggyback off of that, you saying that's almost like the what about the UTM, the U, the UAS traffic management setup? Is that almost like a preliminary to that final destination? It there, is. Or? We consider that part of our UTM. So UTM is or you know unmanned traffic management is is really it's a NASA research project. That's not an FAA program. That's a NASA research project. NASA's research is doing all kinds of wonderful things, some of which will be used by the operators, some of which will um, is just basic research, some of it will be used by other public entities and some uh, like military, et cetera, and some of it will be used by the FAA. Lance is our first step in, in a, it, think of it as a suite of products. So, or, or another way to think of it is VFR, IFR are sets of rules of how to operate in the same airspace. Mm-hmm. It's a different set of rules, but you're operating in the same airspace. Class B airspace, you can be VFR, you can be IFR, you can be special VFR, you can be VFR as an ultralight with a special provision to go in and out without a radio. We have all kinds of things. Well, now think of UTM like that. It's another set of rules, and that's why we have things like Lance to mm-hmm. authorize uh, operations. While that's being, again, before we get to that point, and I, that's that's a great end point, um, what about extending like current airspace authorizations that are attached to waivers in those lance areas when that switches over uh, the carry across because it's you know there's there's going to be some some uh, crossover time frame on that um, and a lo- kind of a, a, to piggyback on that too uh, long term plans for uh, the contracting towers that, that Lance is not including right at this sure, point. Sure, right. Um, so for the audience here, Lance um, is covering much of the country where we have FAA towers, where because it's the FAA Air Traffic Control Center in those areas mapping out and saying these are the areas we've determined that um, we can safely operate an unmanned system. Um, there are military. Airspaces that, and when I say military airspaces, um, there are areas of the country which are have military air traffic controllers providing services to um, civil operators, and so those haven't been mapped yet. We haven't mapped the contract towers. Those are additional phases. We will continue to do that, but it is linked to, to controlled airspace. Mm-hmm. So G is not not the areas we're looking at, but we are looking at uh, you know B, C, D, and E in conjunction with an airport, mapping all of those areas out, and mm-hmm. then eventually they'll be included. But it takes time. Sure. Um, you mentioned that, you know, the, the, the traffic management system. Uh, one of the things that kind of depends on that is the, uh, the remote identification. Um, is there a concept as to what that's supposed to look like? Um, you know, in the Part 61 world and above, we have ADS-B. Right. What what is this remote identification and, and, and what is that imagined to be? So again, remote identification takes on a new role when we're talking autonomous unmanned operations, and and that is really um, the, the focus is how do you you got to know where your aircraft is, mm-hmm. right? You don't know where your aircraft is. Think of ID like that. The operator has to know where their aircraft is. So we're building that ID system, first and foremost, so you know where your aircraft and you know where other people's aircraft are. So you're not running in, into them. So it's not it's not self-separation. It's literally mm-hmm. giving the information to the operator who's responsible. They know where their aircraft is. That's what we need if you're going to go beyond visual line of sight. So that's the first role. Mm-hmm. Also, communities and security folks want to know what does compliance look like? How do I know whether that's a legal operation or not a legal op- uh, operation? And that's really what they're they're looking yeah. for. 
Are we talking um, remote identification that's attached to the aircraft or attached to the controller? Um, actually, uh, we have laid out, uh, uh, earlier this year, we have our annual um, symposium where we educate folks. I'm in the rulemaking process now, so mm -hmm. I can't talk about the actual rule, but what we, what we did in that symposium is laid out. Um, it, it's about the safety and knowing where to locate the mm -hmm. operator. So there are, we proposed areas where, for example, an AMA flying field. That's it. You identify the field, not the person. Mm -hmm. um, there are some things that you may be operated a little bit further away. You identify the uh, the, the control station, um, and then some. You know, if you're going across the country hundreds of miles, then you you need to identify off the aircraft. So it's. Um, not intended to be one answer, just like VFR. There's not one answer. You can right. have a no radio operation. You can have uh, no transponder operations. You know, depends on what you're doing. So uh, we've got a f several more topics that we want to cover before we uh, let you out of the studios. And I thank you very much for stopping by. Uh, we're talking again with Earl Lawrence, director of the FAA UAS Airspace Integration Office. And we're going to have more with Earl coming up right after this on EA Radio. And this is the Drone Zone, and we're back again with Earl Lawrence, and we have some very fun questions. We do, we do. we, we, we got to get through the bureaucratic the stuff bureaucratic first, stuff, you know, yep. but and there is so much confusion uh, because, it's new, because of its newness, I think. There's so much confusion about uh, these different programs and what can I do and how do I do some of this stuff. Um, let's talk a little bit about the idea of who can, who is supposed to be overseeing and controlling this. So we have... Uh, in the commercial operations especially, but otherwise, too, we have the local folks that may have their restrictions, but and you know, the federal airspace, but um, where is that crossing over? So what, one of the things that some of us will say is um, the FAA tells me where I can fly in the air, but the locals tell me where I can take off and land, essentially. But how how is that meshing how is that integrating and what's the intention of the FAA on that so it, it is difficult it is difficult to work out how to integrate that and that is probably the biggest challenge going back to what i mentioned in the mm -hmm. in the previous segment about Mayor Lee and saying that you know it's not just the airport the airport is now in everybody's hands and and so that's not new to aviation it's just that we've have this long history of working out those interactions in between us. I, it, I, I have examples where we fully certified helicopter operations um, to bring people in and out of events and things like that, and then the town shuts them down. Well, why? Because you got to land somewhere. Ultimately, you have to land, and so you have to, in life, work with your local community. Mm -hmm. That's just the facts of the matter. But um, from an FAA standpoint, we are responsible for safety, and we are uh, responsible for managing the airspace. Mm -hmm. um, these are aircraft by law. Congress said yeah. So all even model aircraft, um, it's mm -hmm. it's in an act of Congress. So we we are bound to follow that. Sure. Um, and I look at the airspace system, and maybe the the listeners can think about that. This is is a big public beach, okay? And public beaches across the United States, you have to have access to the public beach. So there's a requirement to have access, but there's different rules about how close you can build the houses to the beaches and and different things. But it belongs to everybody, and we have to figure out a way to to assure that everybody has that access. So. This then let's turn the corner from um, who makes what rules to who has what enforcement. Yes, uh, this is a challenge that as a commercial operator that I run into every day. Of I approach a client yeah. and they're like, "Well, I got this kid from church that has this thing, then he's uh, doing all of our shots for us." And I'm shaking my head. And I'm like, "You understand that that's not legal, but what are you going to do about it?" Right. You know. Um, so where is the enforcement, or where should the enforcement come from on, on these rules? Well, ultimately, on the FAA rules, that's FAA. Mm -hmm. But also there's local r rules and regulations. Noise, that's local. Uh, privacy, that's local. local right. When I say local, state, ultimately. Right. Not federal. A, it, but non-federal. <laughs> right. um, you know, the whole uh, peeping Tom laws mm -hmm. and, the, and, and all those kind of things are all nuisance laws, noise laws. Those are all local community, and they have full jurisdiction over that. When you talk about using... A drone for commercial purposes so that use that is a violation of an FAA regulation and we would handle that and of course we use that um, with our compliance philosophy and you know you know we try with the first step when we mm -hmm. learn if we know of who's doing that and they're identified then we can go out and we start with you know are you clueless right. <laughs> um, you know do we just have to educate you and, and it's are the you beginning clueless of or defiant yes yeah. exactly <laughs> all right so 
Um, in the early days of aviation, you know, there was people were flying, and wait a minute, you need to have a license for that. You know, so we come up with licensure, and then people are showing other people how to fly. So wait a minute, you need to be a licensed instructor. And then there's different types of flights. We had different types of licenses. Are we heading down that same path with the uh, with the U, the whole UAS program that we may see different certifications or uh, you know instructor certifications or you know those those kind of yeah. uh, endorsements? Absolutely, something? we're actually already there. Mm-hmm. Um, so, what, for example, what's your endorsement today for being a fish spotter in a manned aircraft? There there isn't one, but they have specific training. Right. What's your endorsement for? Um, inspecting pipelines for the oil company. Mm-hmm. Well, there's a set of, of training, and, and, and my point is, when we look at our rules, we don't think of it when we're introducing something brand new like this. Mm-hmm. It's not about 107. It's not about 61. We say, what were the things, the qu- were requirements for that? What were the knowledge that you had to know? Do you have to know airspace? What are, what, what are the things you need to know to safely operate that system? And some things will be in the rule, and some things will be in industry training, and it'll all evolve. Um, and so if the industry is taking care of it and they are providing the training and making sure, like operating, inspecting cell towers mm-hmm. with drones, well, there's something called RF, radio frequency on there. Mm-hmm. If yep. you just take a regular off-the-shelf drone and you try to do that, it will crash. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, you will lose control over it. <laughs> you know. Um, and, and, and so there are these things. So we're really looking at it is it's not so much about what reg it falls into or what additional certificate we're having. It's lay out what is needed to operate safely and make sure you have that particular training faa will fill in those holes where 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 needed Mm -hmm. but the focus is on making sure we have those safe operations yeah trying to find uh the the line again between um an industry certification versus a federal license certification of some sort and where that's going to land, I think it's still kind of up for some debate. Well, it is, and and, and that's why I want to highlight. That's not a bad thing. What no, we're, no, it's what, not. What we're what we're doing here is the FAA will ensure that the safety is achieved. If the community is filling those holes and provi- ensuring that safety up front, we don't have to do as much in the regulatory mm-hmm. side. So it's going to be a balance, and it always has been. Well, speaking of safety, in in regards to that, are you guys planning on implementing like a practical? part of the 107 just to prove just like when you get your regular ga pilot's license so i like to remind everybody 107 is the visual line of sight rule okay okay it's not over people and it's visual line of sight and it's really that's a basic thing so no when i'm answering that to me i look at what does a pilot need to do we don't necessarily need to do a, a practical for that you go out in the park you crash that's that's part of learning you know what i mean that, that yeah, i mean i mean it, you yeah. may want to get an instructor you may want to get some help but you want to start operating over people hey okay now we have additional training requirements and and some people look at that as you can do that under 107 under a waiver well that's what you need in the waiver you need to come in with your training requirements your practical requirements mm-hmm. to show that i know how i'm going to operate you want to do beyond visual line of sight well that's not in 107 right um, yeah. you know those are other things you got to come in with your training requirements so that gets back to what i was saying what are the things that that pilot needs to know in order to safely do that operation, and we will require those those things to be done. So, the from my perspective, at least, the commercial drone operators are kind of clamoring f- for more, mm-hmm. frankly, from the yes. FAA, uh, more clarity, more structure to something to, to give them that provenance of mm-hmm. of I know what I'm doing here. Yes. Um, the opposite side of that is you have the hobbyists that are saying, "Don't touch me." Correct. Um, and there is a lot of uh, contention between there, and, and you you have people like myself and, and Michael over here that play both sides of that. I, I do a lot of hobbyist work, and I fly commercially, you know. And I have to remember, okay, wait a minute. If I'm flying this as a hobbyist, I might have to call the tower. But if I'm flying this commercially, I need the waiver, you know. And the, that kind of confusion. And one of the Clear points of, of uh, I guess, uh, um, kind of flashpoints on this uh, came with uh, the uh, uh, aviation uh, House Aviation Subcommittee uh, meeting in April where uh, somebody from the FAA testified uh, that there were the, the things there. <laughs> uh, it actually, it wasn't you. I'm going to quote something. It wasn't you. Angela. Thank you. That was her name. Angela uh, Stubblefield. And, and it, it set off a yes. whole flurry of things. And... It started off as very, very sensible to me in that they said that the three things that they needed to make make right. things safe, 
uh, was what we just talked about. Uh, focus on compliance with airspace rules. That makes complete sense. The remote identification, which is still some question out there, but we understand what we're talking about. Drone registration, that's pretty simple. Everything's an aircraft. Let's register everything. But the last thing that she said after that was the current exemption was, quote, uh, the current exemption for model aircraft, Section 336, is the fundamental barrier to implementing these policies. And everybody's head exploded. <laughs> so, so that right there uh, is is part of the confusion on this. Now, there are those that have said that that meant that the FAA wants to cut off all of hobbyists. I don't think that that was the intention there, right? Uh, not at all. <laughs> no, a- absolutely not. And and I like to remind people we regulate kites. Um, we regulate right. balloons. Um, they're in part 101 where modelers used to still are yeah. um, to where, the, where we have them. Um, we certainly will find a way to do uh, yeah. to manage all of it. I, I think the real point is is right now um, Congress's direction and and we're, we obviously follow that mm-hmm. um, is to handle a group separately to not within our rules and and that's um, adds a perception mm-hmm. among those folks that are aren't just. AMA members, for example, it doesn't say AMA members flying in a model park don't have to, you know, have have right. some uh, privileges. It says, you know, other things that are interpreted by most people of as is it's open season, mm-hmm. so to speak. <laughs> um, and, and and we have to keep things simple. And and really, what I, I I like to look at it is, we don't say one particular group doesn't have to look at the pay attention to the red, green, and yellow lights on right. the stop signals, okay? Um, whether you're a bicyclist, whether you're walking, or, or whether you're driving, or whether you're a commercial trucker or whatever, we we have to have one set of rules for the stoplights, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, and, and these are the kind of things that we're talking about is the airspace has changed, things are changing, um, that is our statement from the FAA, and that's where it was really Angela's um, uh, point there, is we can't have separate rule, rules now. Mm-hmm. We can have separate requirements. I, I don't right. want to, you know, it, it, for the area and thing like that, it's not one size fits all. But what we have to uh, at least have authority over everybody if we are going to remove that confusion. Otherwise, it's going to stay confusing. Well, I- exactly. I think clarity is really what, what have, at the end of the day, is probably what everybody's looking for. And uh, but uh, that that's exactly what I was what I was kind of hoping to hear was the, we're going to have a different definition that includes the basic requirements and you know you, you are this group but you're going to have to have those basics in there mm-hmm. yeah I can respect that um, uh, you got one question about uh, no <laughs> fine uh, so with that being said what can you what can you uh, uh, add to our conversation here to try and clear up any of those those kind of things that, that I haven't touched on sure. so far. Well, well, just in general, because it, it's always time short on, on oh, radio. Yes. It always yes. seems to be a long time. <laughs> yep. And and this is the drone zone, and I want to highlight the FAA has a drone zone. Yeah. Um, yep. And that's actually where yeah, our centers... You were going to bust me on that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. Exactly. Oh, no, not at all. It's, it's fabulous. We are just saying, you know, so you go to, you know, www.fa.gov slash UAS, and mm-hmm. you'll end up in that drone zone um, and see those connections. Tremendous amount of materials, education there. I know it can, it's not always the best to navigate, but we're always improving it. We're always looking at better. In fact, you go on there, you got a hobbyist click or you got a commercial click, mm-hmm. um, and you can get all kinds of great information. We have one of the only 1 800 lines that's open during the week. We have answer men, um, you know, mm-hmm. and, and ladies that uh, you can call up and, and get answers to your question, and uh, we can help you find your way through the bureaucracy. Excellent. Well, Earl, I would thank you for coming in and talking with us for this last half hour. And this has been the Drone Zone at EAA Radio.